the on-site educational home building series. I've been a finished carpenter for about 30 years and I've been writing about my craft for almost half that long. And if I've learned anything about carpentry, it's that there's a lot to learn about carpentry. That's the purpose of this series of programs, beginning with Mastering the Miter Saw. This is part two of Mastering the Miter Saw. We'll be cutting compound angles and acute angles. But before we get to that, I want to review the basics. That's what I covered in part one. If you missed any of that program, be sure to order a copy. There's tips and techniques for beginners and pros. But let's review a few of those basics now, beginning with the system that I use to cut miters. In part one, I introduced a new method for cutting miters. I don't visualize my corners anymore. I use the long point, short point method. This acute angle is called the long point of the miter. This obtuse angle is called the short point of the miter. That's all you need to know. You don't have to visualize the corners anymore. With casing, the long point of the miter is always against the fence, and the short point is toward you just the way you want it, because all your measurement marks with casing are made on the short point of the material. That way, when you go to cut a miter, it's real easy to line the blade up with your measurement mark and guarantee a precise cut. The same is true with baseboard. When you cut baseboard, for an inside corner, the long point is always against the fence. And for an outside corner, the short point is against the fence. All the measurement marks are always made across the top of baseboard. So when you cut it in position, you can see those measurement marks clearly and guide the blade right to a mark so you can make precise cuts. And the same holds true with crown molding. When you cut crown molding in position, the long point for an inside corner is always against the fence and the short point for an outside corner is always against the fence. And once again, the measurement marks, just like baseboard, are right here. This time it's on the bottom of the molding, but because you have to cut crown molding in position upside down, all your measurement marks are always made on crown molding along the bottom, and this way you can see those measurement marks and guide the blade on your saw right to the mark when you want to make a precise cut. But notice this. In program one, all I did was cut simple miters by swinging a saw to the left or to the right. Even for this crown molding that has a compound angle to it, the bevel is cut because the molding is standing in position up against the saw. But there's a lot of molding that's too big to stand in position, and you have to cut it on a flat, like this baseboard. I can't even fit it in a saw. It has to be cut on the flat. That means instead of swinging the miter, I'm going to tip the bevel. And that's all I do when I cut baseboard on the flat, is use the bevel function on the saw. Now for cutting crown molding on the flat, I'll be using the bevel function of the saw and the miter function of the saw to cut a compound miter. And for acute angles, I'll be having to use an acute angle jig. But let's get back to baseboard. No matter what molding you're cutting, you always have to start with a cut list. So let's go get that now. Before I cut any material, I want to say a few words about safety. Construction is a dangerous occupation, and you should take safety seriously no matter which tool you're using. I give my apprentices a few tips before I allow them to start cutting on a saw, and I hope you'll follow those tips too. The first one is, when you use a power miter saw, always keep your hands locked behind the fence. That's the safest way to use the saw, and your hand will never have a tendency to wander toward the blade. Besides, that's the only way you can guarantee precise cuts. With your hand locked behind the edge of the back of the fence, and your thumb wrapped around the front of the molding, you can control the material and slowly inch the material 
right up to the blade. Let me show you what I mean. You'll notice I waited for the saw blade to stop moving before I pulled it up out of the material. That's important for two reasons. First, for safety. If you wait for the blade to stop moving before you pull it out of the material, you'll never be tempted to move your hand underneath the blade while it's still moving. And second, if you wait for the blade to stop moving before you pull it out of the material, the teeth won't chatter along the miter and mess up a perfect cut. And another thing. And this is really important. Never attempt to cut a piece of molding that's shorter than 12 inches. Your fingers are worth a lot more than any piece of molding. And finally, if you do have to cut a piece of molding that won't reach to the end of the fence, then use a clamp. This clamp is provided with a saw and slips in quickly and easily. So easy that you should never be tempted to make a cut without it. That's all there is to it. You can still lift it up and adjust the piece incrementally. And if you don't have a clamp like this, and if it wasn't supplied with your saw, then carry a fast acting clamp right near your saw base where it's easy to reach and you won't be tempted to make a cut without a clamp. There are several other safety concerns that I cover in a slideshow that accompanies this DVD, so be sure to watch that before you use this tool. When America was first settled, carpenters managed all their work, even finish work, with an axe and an adze, like this mantel tree in Fairbanks House, one of the oldest timber frame homes in America, built in 1636, about 20 years after Shakespeare died. Until 150 years ago, the nicest carpentry work was accomplished with chisels, gouges, and hand planes, like the egg and dart architraves around on this mantelpiece from Cliveden, a Georgian-style home built in the late 18th century. But since the Industrial Revolution, moldings have been made by machines, so in today's homes, carpenters often do their best work with a miter saw, whether it's casing around doors and windows, or crown molding with acute angles. But be sure to make an acute angle jig before attempting this job. You'll find measured drawings and instructions on how to make and use the jig included with this DVD. Acute angle jigs and miter saws are the perfect choice for challenging jobs, whether for crown molding or baseboard. Miter saws also make it easy to install radius moldings on ceilings and radius casing around windows. Almost every profile in this room was made with silicone in a mold, even the straight pieces, but every piece was cut on a miter saw. And for diagonal paneling that wraps a sharp outside corner, no tool does the job better than a compound miter saw. Always wear safety glasses. Safety glasses used to be clumsy, they scratched easily and they fogged up as soon as you put them on. But there's no longer any excuse for not wearing safety glasses. Today, safety glasses are available in a variety of styles. They're scratch resistant and some are even fog free. The tinted goggles at the center top are fog free and they're available from Dust Be Gone. They're great for 100% protection. The wraparound glasses at the left and the right are available from most home centers and you can find a distributor through Fast Cap too. The glasses at the bottom are mine. They're prescription glasses made from high impact polycarbonate and they have protective side shields too. Always wear hearing protection. I can't hear my daughter's telephone ring anymore, both because the pitch on her phone is the same as the tinnitus ringing in my ears and because I've lost hearing in both my ears because of loud noise. If only I'd worn hearing protection when I started in this business. Without getting into decibels, I'll simply say that when it comes to hearing protection, something is better than nothing. 
Find the type of hearing protection that you're most comfortable with and wear it always. I like the earplugs with the neck cord on the bottom right. I always know where they are. The expanding foam plugs bottom left offer more protection, but I lose them too easily. And I've never been comfortable wearing either of the headsets at the top, though they're often the most effective. Always wear dust protection. Dust protection is like hearing protection except instead of being measured in decibels, it's measured in microns. And with the type of material carpenters cut these days, and recent tests suggest that wood sawdust is carcinogenic, you should always wear a dust mask or a respirator, in addition to providing plenty of ventilation. The respirator on the bottom left offers the most protection. The disposable masks at the bottom right and top left offer only fair protection, though they're more comfortable and readily available from home centers. The surgical type mask at the top right is available from Dust Be Gone. It's comfortable to wear and can be washed repeatedly. Use a dust collector. Dust collectors are important too, especially for table saws, chop saws, and routers. On the job site, a shop vac is better than nothing. But in a shop, you can collect a lot more dust with a central system. Dust from a miter saw is the most difficult to control, and I'm still experimenting with this contraption. Miter saw safety. Never disable a saw guard. Saw guards are made for a purpose. Believe me, I've seen the statistics. Too many serious accidents are caused by carpenters removing the guards. Don't remove the guard on your saw. There are safer, easier, and more accurate ways of lining up the blade with the measurement mark. Keep your hand behind the fence. I'm not a safety spokesman for the miter saw industry, and I'm not just repeating the instructions I've read that come with the tools. The reason I keep my hand at the back of the fence is so I can control the workpiece and creep the measurement mark slowly up to the blade. But the practice also saves my hand from a common miter saw injury. Remember, your hands and fingers are worth more than any piece of molding. Use clamps. Yes, I use clamps too, whenever the need arises. And that's why I always keep them hanging from my miter saw stand, so I won't hesitate to reach for a clamp whenever I'm about to make a dangerous cut. Remember, if you hear that little voice in the back of your head whispering a warning, stop and listen to it. Wait for the saw to stop before reaching past the blade. I'm a production carpenter and I break this rule far more than I should, but I try not to. Most miter saws are equipped with electric brakes these days and it only takes a couple of seconds for the blade to stop. Sure, if your saw has a guard, what's the risk? Well, what if that guard hangs up just once? Whenever I install baseboard, I always start with a cut list. A cut list will save me from having to go back and forth from the room to the saw, but it'll also save me from having to visualize the corners while I'm cutting the material at the saw. If you remember, I'm dead set against the visualization method. Let me show you how the cut list works. It's pretty simple. I first measure this piece from an inside corner on the right side to an inside corner on the left. It's 28 and 3 quarters, so I mark it with an inside corner mark here on the right and an inside corner mark on the left. Now this second piece measures 4 inches from an inside corner on the right to an outside corner on the left. So I've made the inside corner mark to the right of the measurement, and I've made the outside corner mark to the left of the measurement. Now the third piece has an outside corner on both sides, and it measures six and a half inches across the face. That's this piece here with an outside corner mark on both sides of the measurement mark. Now this fourth piece, let me scoot over here because I like to face the piece when I'm making my measurement marks and my corner marks. The fourth piece measures four inches from a butt cut at the left-hand corner to an outside corner on the right-hand side. So here's the butt cut to the left side of the measurement and an outside corner 
to the right side of the measurement. Now normally, I'd continue around this room to my left, but for the sake of this lesson, I'm going to pick up this last piece over here in the corner. That's 18 and a half inches. We're going to pretend that there's a self-return here. That's the kind of a cut you have to make if there's a stairway or a doorway with no molding on it, and the baseboard has to terminate right there. It has an inside corner on the left, and we'll cut the piece 18 and a half inches. Now that we have the complete cut list, let's go up to the saw, and I'll show you how to cut these pieces on the flat. Before I start cutting any material on the flat, I want to talk one more time about my alternative to the visualization method. If you remember from program one, when you cut baseboard in position against the fence, for an inside corner, the long point is against the fence. And for an outside corner, the short point is against the fence. The same holds true for even tall moldings, like this one. Notice the long point is against the fence for an inside corner, and the short point is against the fence for an outside corner. But, as you can see, you can't get molding this tall into this miter saw. It just won't fit underneath the blade. So you have no choice. You have to cut it on the flat. But that's not such a big problem. The short point, long point method still works. The only difference is for an inside corner, the long point is against the base of the saw rather than the fence. And for an outside corner, the short point is against the base of the saw. That way, if you put the top of the molding up against the fence, the molding is sitting in the saw just the way it is on the wall. At least the right-hand corner is the right-hand joint, and the left-hand end of the molding is the left-hand joint. So it works perfectly with your cut list. Before we get to the cut list, let me talk for a minute about the difference between cutting on the flat and cutting in position. When you cut on the flat, you don't use the saw at a miter. You set it at 90 degrees and you tip the motor of the saw to a bevel. In order to do that, you want to slide the fences out of the way and release the bevel lock so you can tip the saw back and forth. The first piece on the cut list measures 28 and 3 quarters of an inch, but the most important thing to notice is that it has an inside corner on both ends. Let's cut that one first. Now, this first piece has an inside corner on both ends, and to cut an inside corner, I want the long point against the base. So that means I have to flip the saw in this direction. Now I can cut a long point on this end. Now, this first piece is 28 and 3 quarters of an inch from the long point to the long point of inside corners. So I can take the saw and flip it in the other direction, or I can just take this piece of material and flip it around, which is a lot easier. And since I'm used to having my measurement marks at the top of the baseboard when I cut in position, I'll have my measurement mark on the top of the baseboard here too. I'll hook my tape measure right on the long point of that inside corner and make a measurement mark precisely at 28 and 3 quarters, just the way I do when I'm cutting in position. Not only that, but notice my tape measure is right side up. So I won't make that mistake if it were a 6 or a 9. Now, cutting on the flat is a little bit different than cutting in position. You can hardly ever line up the blade with a measurement mark just by line of sight. You really need to rely on the creep method. See, I've taken the measurement mark and I've just put it on the edge of the guard here. And I'm going to make my first cut with the material just back from that position. Now my hand is clear back here at the edge of my continuous extension wing, and I'll never allow it to travel any closer to the cut than that position. 
and I'll creep the material right up to the blade. There, that finishes the first piece. Now, for the second piece, I'm going to flip the material again, because I always like to start out, if I can, with the top of the material against the fence. That way I don't get confused. The left-hand corner is the left-hand miter, and the right-hand end of the molding is the right-hand miter. For the second piece, it measures four inches. It has an inside corner on the right side and an outside corner on the left. And remember, I like to cut those inside corners first so I can hook my tape measure on them. So I'm going to slide this piece over to here and cut an inside corner on this end with a long point against the base. There. Now that's an inside corner with a long point against the face of the saw. Now I want to cut an outside corner with a short point against the base of the saw. Now the interesting thing about baseboard is I don't have to make my measurement marks at the top of the molding or cut to the top of the molding every time. Baseboard is different than almost every other molding because the bottom of the baseboard is cut square. There's no profile down here like there is at the top of the base or there is on the narrow edge of casing. That means that the long point at the top of the molding is the same length as the long point at the bottom of the molding. If you put a square across it, they measure identically the same. So I can make my measurement marks for baseboard at the top of the molding or the bottom. So in this case, all I have to do is flip the material back so it's right side up, hook my tape measure on the long point of this inside corner, and make a measurement mark at four inches. Now I'm going to take that measurement mark and transfer it down to the very bottom of the molding where the blade will come through. And I'll line that up with this red guard on the saw so I can make my first couple of passes while I creep the measurement mark toward the blade. Now notice I waited until the blade stopped before I pulled it out of the material because this is the piece I wanted. If I hadn't waited for the blade to stop, the teeth would have chewed up the long point of the miter and ruined this piece. Now this third piece measures six and a half inches and has an outside corner on the left and an outside corner on the right. I want to demonstrate how you can change the saw to bevel on the opposite side too and I also want to demonstrate how sometimes when you're cutting molding on a flat, you can end up in a tight spot. So I could cut this outside corner off the left end right now by sliding the piece over to this end and simply cutting it here with the saws already set in that position anyway. But instead, I want to end up having to make a little bit more of a difficult cut in a moment. So now I'm going to flip the saw to the right and notice the bevel gauge goes past 45 degrees, and even from way back here, I can get that dialed in right on 45 degrees. Now I'm going to cut an outside corner on the right end of this piece, and the short point will be against the base. Now. I'm going to flip the material around so I don't have to flip the saw again, and I'm going to line that short point up flush with the end of my extension wing. So you can see what I'm doing a little more clearly because the saw is in the way over there. 
And remember, I've got a tape measure embedded in my extension wing here, so all I have to do is flush up the short point with the end of the extension wing, and I can make a measurement mark right to the six and a half inch mark on my tape. Now, since I've turned the material around, the saw is all set to cut this outside corner. So this short point will be against the base. And I'm going to line the pencil, mu pencil mark up so it's just beyond the red guard. Now I can cut this. Well, I'm not that comfortable cutting there with my hand that close to the saw. And I could cut it. Well, I'm not that comfortable cutting like this in this direction with my left hand on the saw because I'm right-handed and I'm not used to cutting with my left hand. So the thing to do in this case is just to grab a clamp, clamp the material down to my extension wing, and then I can operate the saw one-handed. Now I can creep the piece back a little bit at a time. Just a tiny bit more. You can see how you can control this perfectly. There, a perfect cut right at the pencil line on the short point. Now piece number four has a butt cut on the left side and an outside corner on the right, and it's four inches long. So let's cut that one next. Well, first I'll take the clamp off this piece. It's nice and handy to have those clamps around. Now I'm going to flip this piece around so I can cut it with the top up against the fence. That way I know the right hand end has to have an outside corner. This is the right hand end. The saw is already set in the right direction to cut an outside corner bevel with the short point against the base. So all I have to do is make my first cut. Now, I'm going to flip the material again. I'm going to take the short point, and that's right here on the very edge of the material, and I'm going to line that short point up with the very end of my extension wing because I've got a tape measure embedded in the extension wing on this side of the saw too. So I don't have to pull out a tape measure to make this measurement. I can just line the short point up with my fingernail right with the very edge of the extension wing and make my mark at four inches. Now it's a butt cut. Now all I have to do is take this piece and lay it down in the saw and change the saw to a butt cut. Once again, I'll pick up the saw. Oh, did you hear that? This saw has an automatic detent return. So if you set it properly, as soon as you swing the saw to the left, it'll pop right back up and you'll have a 90 degree detent so you can stop your saw at zero automatically. And I'm ready to make this butt cut. And notice I'm cutting with my left hand now just as comfortably as I would with my right, since there's a safety release switch on both sides of this handle. Now that finishes off piece number four. There's one more piece we have to cut. This last piece, 18 and a half inches, has a self-return on the right side and an inside corner on the left. I want to cut that self-return first, just like I always do, and I'll show you how right now. I can cut that out of this piece. It's got a butt cut on both ends of it right now, but the top of it's pointing toward me. And I want to turn it around so that the top of it will point toward the fence. That way I'll know for sure that the right side is the right end of the piece and the left side is the left end of the piece. Now, I want to cut an outside corner on this end. That's really what a self-return is. So I'm going to flip the saw down to 45 degrees and lock it in place. And I'm just going to cut an outside corner right on this end.
Now, this is a self-return. It's not an outside corner. It looks like an outside corner, but the difference is I want to measure from the long point. That's the furthest extension of the molding, and that's why I like to cut self-returns first. That way, I can take my tape measure and just hook it right on the long point of the self-return. This piece has to be 18 and a half inches long. I'm going to make my measurement mark right here on the bottom of the baseboard. Now, I need to transfer that mark down to the back of the molding. I can eyeball this pretty closely, but if you're uncomfortable doing it, use a little square to transfer that line because that's where the long point of the miter has to be cut. Now, I can slide this board just past the guard here and get ready to make this cut. And Once again, my hands are kind of crossed from the way I'm usually comfortable cutting, so I'm going to grab a clamp and I'll inch this board up just a little bit at a time because I want this cut made precisely. That'll do. Well, that finishes piece number four, almost. There's just one last thing I have to do. Remember, this is a self-return, so I want to cut the little miter, the cap, that's going to finish this piece and term terminate this piece and return to the wall. I'll cut that out of another piece of material. A lot of people get confused when they're cutting these little self-return caps because they don't know, gee, does it get cut off one end or the other end, the left side or the right side? Which one do you need? It's real easy to figure it out. The self-return is on the right side of this piece. So the little cap you have to cut to finish it has to be cut off the left side of the other piece. And that's why I put this piece of stock in the saw with the top against the fence. So it's easy for me to figure out that I want to cut the cap off the left side of this piece of material. I'm going to take the saw and I'm going to flip it to the left. I'm going to cut really just an outside corner on this end of the board. Now that's the miter I want. And in order to use this piece, I need to cut right along the short point of the miter and save just the little miter itself to make the self-return. So I'll put the piece into the saw upside down so I can see that short point line. And I'll bring the saw back to 90 degrees. And now all I have to do is creep this piece up to the blade and cut right along the short point. And that's one time when you really want to wait for the blade to stop before you pick the saw up out of the wood. Now this is the piece I need. And it's going to finish off this self-return. Get it on here just right. So it looks great when it terminates against the wall. And that finishes off cutting baseboard on the flat. When you cut baseboard on the flat, the base of the saw is the wall. Always make the first cut with the top of the baseboard against the fence, so the right-hand corner is on the right side and the left-hand corner is on the left side. Never move your hand from the edge of the extension wing, if you can help it. Lock your fingers against the extension wing so you can control the exact movement of the material as you creep the measurement mark toward the blade. For inside corners, the long point of the miter is against the base of the saw. For outside corners, the short point of the miter is against the base of the saw. Sometimes I flip the material, sometimes I flip the saw, but I always cut inside corners first because they're easiest to measure from.
To cut a short piece with two inside corners, just flip the material around. If you don't have room to flip the material, flip the bevel of the saw. Unlike casing and crown, miters on baseboard are 90 degrees to the molding, so you can measure from the top or the bottom of the material. Position the material with the measurement mark flush with the edge of the throat guard, then creep the material up to the blade. To measure from an outside corner, flush the short point up with the edge of the throat guard or with the edge of your extension wing, then hook your tape measure there too. As you can see, some crown molding is just too big to be cut in position. The guard on the back of the saw is hitting the top of the crown molding before the blade is allowed to penetrate the bottom of it. Now there are some saws that will cut crown molding in position even up to six inches in height and baseboard too standing up. But even those saws won't cut crown any larger than that. Some moldings made out of polyurethane like this one or MDF, like a lot of moldings I've been running into, are truly gargantuan. And you have to have a sliding compound miter saw to cut those. A sliding compound miter saw is also useful for cutting wide boards like shelving. You can cut up to 12 inches with one of these saws. They're almost like a mini radial arm saw. But their real purpose is for cutting crown molding on the flat. When you cut crown molding on the flat, you have to be concerned about two angles the miter and the bevel and both have to be dialed in perfectly or the joinery won't be tight. Because it's difficult to dial in the bevel on a saw accurately it's a lot easier to flip the material. Flip the material end for end and you can cut the opposite bevel simply by swinging the miter. It saves a lot of time, it's a lot more efficient to just bevel in one direction. But there are problems with that. Remember, you always want to be able to see the measurement mark right on the bottom of the crown molding where the saw blade is going to enter so you can cut precisely. When you flip the material, sometimes that measurement mark is right up against the fence. The other half of the time, the measurement mark is toward you, right where you want it, so you can bring the saw blade right to the mark and cut precisely. But when it's against the fence, you can't do that. When it's against the fence, you have to guess at where the saw is going to enter the material and kind of fool around in order to cut precisely. It's not very productive. I've got a little trick that I use to make it much easier to cut crown molding on the flat. And that is always cut the left hand inside and the right hand outside corners first. Now those are the corners that are up against the fence. Well, if you had a measurement mark, it would be hidden there. So if you cut those corners first and then measure from them, your measurement mark will always be away from the fence toward you. And you'll be able to guide the saw blade into the material perfectly and cut precise lengths each time. Let me show you what I mean. This is that same crown molding I was cutting in part one. Remember with the profile on the bottom of it? But before I can cut this crown molding on the flat, where I'm going to be worried about the bevel angle and the miter angle, I need to know one more piece of information. I need to know what the spring angle is. Let me show you what I mean by spring angle. The spring angle is the angle that the crown molding springs away from the wall and up toward the ceiling. In order to read that angle, just place the crown molding against the wall and the position is going to sit and slip a protractor behind it until the protractor is tied up against the wall and the back of the crown and read that angle. 44 degrees. That's pretty close to 45 and close enough for me because the two most common types of crown molding are a 45 degree spring angle and a 38 degree spring angle. Now there's another way to measure that spring angle with a little bit more accuracy. And that's with an angle finder like this one. You hold the angle finder up against the wall and then position the crown molding 
so that the angle finder follows the back of the crown molding, remember, you're not reading the exact spring angle. So take that measurement, figure out exactly what it is. Then if you subtract the angle on the miter gauge from 180 degrees, you'll have the spring angle of the crown. Once you have the spring angle, there's one other angle you have to read. That's the angle of the corner. Don't assume that it's 90 degrees. Make sure you measure every single corner angle because you have to be within one degree. To read a corner angle, you can use a protractor again. The spring angle has to be close, but the corner angle has to be right on. And this is just a hair off 90 degrees. And that's really important when you're cutting crown molding. Once you have the spring angle and the corner angle, then you can find the miter and bevel angles. You can get those off of a crown chart like this one. On a crown angle chart, the first column is the wall angle. You'll notice this one goes from 86 degrees to 96 degrees. This is kind of abbreviated. A good crown chart will go from 0 to 180 degrees. The second two columns are for 38 degree crown molding. You notice that it says 52 up here. That's the angle that it drops from the ceiling, so don't let that confuse you. The last two columns over here are for 45 degree crown molding. There's another way to find the miter bevel angles for crown molding, and it's a lot easier. These days, I use a Bosch angle finder. Let's go over to the mock-up and I'll show you how this is used. With a Bosch angle finder, you don't need a chart. All you need is just one tool. The first thing you do is just start it up, push the start button, wait for it to settle out, and enter in the spring angle. Now the spring angle is a little bit tough to get. I drew a couple of lines on here, make it easier for me to get this right exactly on the spring angle. So you want it to say 45 degrees even. Once you have the exact spring angle dialed in, press the black BVMT button one time and SPR will show up in the lower display. That stands for spring angle. The next step is to place the tool up against the corner and read the corner angle. In this case, it's 90 degrees right on. That's pretty rare. Now you push the BVT button one more time, and you notice CNR showed up. That's the abbreviation for corner. So now we've entered in the spring angle and the corner angle. Press the BVMT button another time, and it's going to say MTR in the display. That 35.3 is the miter angle. Press the button one last time, and BVL shows up in the display. That 30 degrees is the bevel angle. And that's all you need to cut crown molding on the flat. I'll take those angle measurements, and I'll write them on every corner in the house. So that way, when I do my cut list for cutting on the flat, I'll have the angle measurements with me right on my cut list. Now let's go cut a few pieces on the flat. Now we're ready to cut some crown molding on the flat. If you remember, this profile here is at the bottom edge of the molding, right where your measurement marks are made. For the first cut I want to make at the saw, I always want to make it with the bottom edge up against the fence. That means this molding is upside down. So kind of like cutting in position, I want to remember in my mind that for that first cut, the right end is the left side of the molding. Now let me show you my cut list. This is the same list, basically, that I made for cutting in position. I've just added a few things. Notice, here's the first piece. It's a 27 and an eighth with an inside corner and an inside corner. And beneath each corner, I've added the miter and the bevel angles that I have to cut those corners to. Now, this corner here is the only one that didn't read 90 degrees. Since I built that mock-up myself, most of those corners are exact 90 degrees. This one wasn't. So the miter and bevel angles are a little bit different. 33 and a half for the miter and 28 and three quarters for the bevel. Whereas this corner is a standard miter and bevel for a 90 degree angle. For standard angles like that, I just write OK underneath the corner and I know to turn the saw to the standard measurements. Most miter saws do have standard measurements on the miter and bevel gauges for 45 and 38 degree crown. Now let's take a look at this first piece. It has two inside corners and remember I want to cut the left-hand inside corner first. It has a 35 and a quarter degree miter and a 30 degree bevel. 
So I'm going to swing the saw to those measurements and cut that corner before I cut this one. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to tilt the bevel to 30 degrees and lock it down right there. Now I'm going to swing the miter. Now I want to cut an inside corner so all I'm concerned about is the long point being against the fence. That's what gives me the clue on which way to swing the miter. I mean I could swing the miter this way but then that would be for an outside corner. So I'm going to swing this way and I want to go to 35 and a quarter, just a little bit past 35. Now before I make this cut, I've got to make sure that I slide this fence out of the way. Otherwise I'll cut right into it. I've seen that happen often enough. On this nice new saw, I don't want to hurt it. And there's no measurement mark here, so I'm just going to... Now I've cut the first corner and I flip the molding end for end and it's real easy to measure for the second corner. You notice that the bottom of the crown molding is now facing me. I can hook my tape measure right on the long point of that inside corner, measure across and make a mark right on the bottom of the crown molding at 27 and an eighth. Next, I swing the miter of the saw to 35 and a quarter. Oops, nope, nope, nope. This is that special corner. That right-hand miter, that right-hand inside corner, wasn't 90 degrees. It had a 33 and a half degree miter and a 28 and three quarter degree bevel. So I've got to do these special. 33 and a half will put me right about there. And a 28 and three quarter bevel. Right about there. Now I'm set to cut this corner. I'm going to bring the saw in and line the blade up with that mark. Now sometimes it's hard to see exactly where the blade's going to come into the material there, but at least I can see the mark so I can use my hand right here against the saw fence, the saw base, to slide that material back and forth just a little bit at a time and inch that blade or rather inch that material right up against the blade. Now that's the first piece. Now I can cut the second piece. For the second piece, I need a piece with an outside corner on the left and an inside corner on the right. Neither of those pieces are difficult to cut. The measurement mark would be out toward me on both pieces, so I can take my pick which corner to cut first. If I look at this piece right here, it already has an outside corner on the left side, which is just what I want, but I cut that outside corner at a strange miter and bevel angle, so I'm going to forget about that. Besides, I'd rather hook my tape measure on the long point of the inside corner so it's easier for me to pull my measurement to the outside corner. So I'm going to cut the inside corner first. The saw is already set up almost exactly the way I want it. Let me adjust this so we got that exact 35 and a quarter miter. And I'm going to adjust the bevel so it's exactly at 30 degrees. The miter and bevel angles are now in the perfect position for both corners of this board. Not only that, I don't have to flip the board in for end either. Everything's set up so that I can cut both joints without moving anything but sliding this board back and forth. Let me cut this in first and I'll show you what I mean. Now I pull a tape measure from the long point of that inside corner and make a mark exactly at 17 and a quarter. Then I'm going to line the blade up with that measurement mark and just slowly creep the material right up to that tube.
That's it. Perfect cut for the second piece. Now I'm going to cut the third piece. It has a self-return on the left side, which is the same as an outside corner, and an outside corner on the right side. And remember, I want to cut left hand inside and right hand outside corners first, because that's when the bottom of the crown molding is up against the fence. So I'm going to cut this outside corner right away. So the first thing I'm going to do, so I'm going to pick this piece up, this is the bottom edge, I'm going to turn it around. As soon as I turn it around, I have to remember that the left end is the right hand corner. And I want to cut an outside corner there, so I want the short point up against the fence. So I'm going to swing the miter to 35 and a quarter. And the bevel's already set just right. So I'm ready to cut this corner. Now I'm going to swing the piece around so that the bottom of the molding is facing me. And I'm going to prepare to measure this last piece. Now, like I said before when we were cutting baseboard, it's real tough to measure off the short point of an outside corner. The best way to do it is to line that corner up with either the end of the saw or better yet, with the end of your extension fence, of your accessory fence here. That way, when that corner is flush, I can hook my tape measure right on the fence and make that measurement mark right at 20 there. That makes that end. But this isn't just an outside corner. This is a self-return. So I want to transfer that measurement up to this end of the board, to the top of the crown, where the long point of the self-return is going to occur. To do that, it's easy to take the piece and slide it over to the edge of my extension wing. And then I can see to the far edge of the extension wing to transfer the mark. That saves me the time it would have taken to pull out a square. Now, I swing the saw to the opposite miter. And I cut to this mark at the back of the crown molding, at the top of the crown. Look at that. It's a perfect example of how hard it is to see a measurement mark, to cut to a measurement mark that's up against the fence, just like I said earlier. That's one of the beauties of a double bevel saw. I can take this molding, I can put it back so that I can see that measurement mark, and now I can flip the bevel of the saw in the opposite direction lock it down to the right bevel and all I have to do is creep that board up to the blade. I've got my left hand hooked around the base of the saw so I won't make the mistake of bringing my hand in too close to the blade and that's going to help me creep this piece up with good control. Now watch, I can even watch it from up above. Now that finishes the third piece. All that's left is to cut the small self-return that goes back to the wall on this end. I'll do that next. When cutting crown molding on the flat, I like to flip the material rather than the bevel angle on the saw. It's much more accurate. But that means that sometimes the bottom of the crown with the measurement mark is against the fence where you can't see it. So I always make my first cut with the bottom against the fence. That means the crown molding is backwards. The right hand end is the left hand corner. With the bottom against the fence, and the saw beveling to the left, you'll only be able to cut left hand inside and right hand outside corners. So look at your cut list. 
always cut those corners first. The piece I've already cut is a right hand outside corner and the piece I'm cutting is a left hand inside corner. Then flip the material so the bottom of the molding is toward you. Pull your measurement and make a mark on the bottom of the crown. Now you're ready to guide the saw blade right to the measurement mark. For some cuts you have to swing the saw to the opposite miter angle, but don't change the bevel angle. Notice I make my first cut with the blade wide of the measurement mark, then I creep the material up to the blade. The piece I want is on the left side of the blade. For pieces that have a left hand inside corner and a right hand outside corner, or for pieces that have two outside corners, or for pieces that are just too long to flip, you have to flip the saw to the opposite bevel. If there's one thing most carpenters are confused by, it's cutting acute angles. If you look at this board right here that I've just cut, it's at 90 degrees. That's a square cut. We call it a butt cut. But it's definitely 90 degrees because that's what my square says it is. But if you put this board down in a saw and you look at the miter gauge, it says zero. Huh, I wonder what that's all about. Let's look at this from another angle. I've got these two pieces of casing here and I've mitered them so that they meet up and form a 90 degree angle just like my square. And I set them in a saw and yep, they're at 90 degrees. The saw says zero, but if I take my saw and I swing it to 45 degrees, it's perfect. Yeah, that's a 45 degree miter. Now why is it that the zero is 90, and that doesn't seem to work at all with a board cut at a square cut, and the 45 is a perfect 45 degree miter, and that seems to work just fine. I don't care if you have a little inexpensive protractor like this one, or one that costs a little more, like this one, or one that costs a lot more, like this Bosch angle finder, the angles that you read on your protractor are still not going to correspond to the angles on your miter saw gauge. Let me tell you why. If this is zero and it's actually 90 degrees, and this is 45, and it really is a 45 degree angle, then all these angles going from 45 up toward zero, they've got to be bigger than 45, not smaller and smaller and smaller. Think of all of these angles as negative numbers that you subtract from 90 degrees in order to reach the corresponding angle with a protractor. Try subtracting zero from 90. What do you get? 90. Try subtracting 45 from 90. What do you get? 45. Or think of it this way. If you have an angle like 70 degrees that you want to cut on your miter saw, subtract 70 degrees from 90. You'll end up with 20 and set your saw right at 20 and you'll cut a 70 degree angle. You know, if all of this subtraction confuses you like it always has me, just do what I've done. Write down the right angles on top of each number and you won't have to think about this anymore. There are some saws that are manufactured with miter saw gauges that reflect the same angles that you have on a protractor. But if your saw isn't one of those, you can see how easy it is to make your own. This works on the other side of 45 degrees too. Let's say you want to cut a 30 degree angle. You take 30 degrees, you subtract it from 90, and you get 60. So you just swing your saw to 60. Whoops! The saw only goes to 50 degrees to the left. So what do you do then? Well, now you've got to have a set of acute angle jigs. Let me get set up and I'll show you how to use them. We've been shooting video for several days now and my voice is starting to crack a little. But let's persevere, because acute angles are one of the most challenging things to cut on a power miter saw. This is the acute angle jig I use now to make cuts on casing and crown molding. The way I used to do it was a lot different. 
Let me show you. I used to take a piece of casing, put it against the fence, and crank my saw over as far as it would go. And then I'd shim the casing away from the fence. Then I'd keep sliding the shim forward until I got close to the angle I wanted. Now this is a crazy way to cut joinery. There's no dependability here. There's no precision. And besides, when I go to cut the miter on the opposite side, I'll never be able to match this exact angle. In addition to that, this is an extremely dangerous way to cut material. If this piece pops out or if this piece drags toward the blade a little bit, my hands are exposed to the blade. I don't do that anymore. Instead, I use an acute angle jig. It's much safer and predictable. I always clamp the jig right to the saw fence. And I always clamp the material to the jig too. This is the only safe way to cut acute angles on a power miter saw. This way, my hand is locked behind the accessory fence and the material is clamped down to the fence itself. I'm not holding the material from being drawn into the blade. And that is precisely what's going to happen when you cut material in a jig like this. Because I've moved the material from a 90 degree angle against the fence to a 45 degree angle on this accessory fence, I've positioned it so that I'm closer to ripping the material. It will have a tendency to draw the material into the blade even more. The sharper the angle you cut, the more the blade is going to want to draw the material as it spins in this direction right into the blade. If you hit a knot or the saw binds, this piece of wood can suddenly jump right into the blade. If you're holding it with just your hand, it will draw your hand with it and you'll cut your fingers or your hand badly. So always clamp the jig and the material to the jig and keep your hand safely behind the accessory fence. Now watch how easy it is to cut one of these pieces securely and safely once you're properly prepared. Now this cut is a perfect 45 degree miter because my accessory jig is built at a perfect 45 degree angle. That means if I move the saw toward the jig, I'm subtracting from this 45 degree angle. For instance, if I stop at, four, at five degrees right there, this is now a 40 degree angle. If I move to 10 degrees, this is now a 35 degree angle. These numbers are operating just the same as they do when you're using the 90 degree fence. Instead of subtracting them from 90 degrees, I'm subtracting them from 45 degrees. Now I'm going to cut this 35 degree angle and we'll make a miter. First I'm going to slide the material a little bit closer so I can make a nice clean cut and then I'll slowly cut through this. Now this is a perfect 35 degree angle. Now I've got to set up a jig on the opposite side to cut a miter on the other piece of casing. The first thing I'm going to do is move the miter saw to 10 degrees in the opposite direction because my accessory jig will probably cover the miter gauge, which it does. And I'll clamp my accessory fence to the saw and I'll clamp my material to the fence just like I did before. And that is the only way to make a perfect miter at an acute angle. 
And that's all there is to cutting an acute angle and casing. Now normally, when I approach a trapezoid window, I always cut the acute angle first. That way, after the acute angle is cut, I can remove my acute angle jigs from the saw and make the standard cuts on the opposite ends of the pieces, except when I have to have an acute angle on both ends. And it just takes a little longer. A sliding compound miter saw will cut an acute angle in crown molding on the flat up to about 50 degrees. That's because the saw will miter to 50 and it'll bevel to 45 degrees. But for any angle, any corner sharper than that, you can't cut it on the flat. Besides, I don't like cutting crown molding on the flat. Like I said, I prefer to cut it in position, especially when I'm cutting acute angles, because that way I don't have to worry about pulling out a crown angle chart to figure out what the miter angle is and what the bevel angle is. I can just set the crown molding in position and pull my miter. Just like cutting casing, whenever I use an acute angle jig, I always clamp it securely in place. Now when you're cutting crown molding in position, remember you have to cut it upside down. This little detail is at the bottom of the molding, so I want to put it up when I place it in the saw, just like so. And then I'm going to rock the molding until the back of the crown molding sits flat against the fence and the jig. I also want the bottom of the crown molding flat against the base of the jig. Once I have it there, I draw a pencil line right across the top of it. Then I'm going to clamp it in position. Now I'm really careful when I cut crown molding on an acute angle, so I clamp the bottom of it and the top. That's because when you're cutting crown molding at an acute angle, you're cutting through even more material and it has an even greater tendency to get pulled into the blade. Now I'm going to pull the miter to 10 degrees. And remember, if I had left it at zero, I would have cut a perfect 45 degree miter because that's what my fence is set at. But I've subtracted 10 degrees from 45 to cut my 35 degree angle. Now I'll just cut through the material slowly. And that finishes that side. I set up my other jig on the opposite side to cut the other piece. Cutting acute angles used to terrify me, and for good reason. It can be one of the most dangerous chores for a carpenter at a chop saw. Be sure to build a good jig, like the one included on this DVD, before attempting the job. Always clamp the jig to the miter saw fence. Position the jig close to the blade, but not so close that it might be cut. And always clamp the material to the jig. If you don't clamp the material to the jig and instead hold the molding with the death grip, when the blade binds, you won't be able to let go, and you'll probably cut your hand.
Very few pieces have acute angles on both ends, so cut the acute angle first, then measure and cut the opposite end without the jig. Cut crown molding the same way, in position against the jig's fence. Clamp the molding at the top of the jig and clamp it to the base of the jig too, just to be sure it doesn't move. Use your hand to steady the molding, not as a clamp. For long pieces, support the molding with a roller stand or a ladder. For large crown moldings, most acute angles can be cut on a compound miter saw with the material lying flat. For instance, if the corner measures 45 degrees, then the miter is 56 degrees and the bevel is 46 and 3 quarter degrees, well within the limits of many compound miter saws. Use a clamp on a cut like this and the joint will be much tighter. Well, that finishes program two. In program one, I covered the basics, cutting moldings in position, because that's the way most carpenters begin learning, and it's the type of work that carpenters do the most of. But in program two, I concentrated on angles, because most people are perplexed by angles, especially compound angles, more than anything. I know I am, and I bet other carpenters are too. I covered a lot of material in program two, I'd like to review some of those techniques right now, beginning with cutting baseboard on the flat. When you cut baseboard on the flat, it's really no different than when you cut it in position against the fence, except that the long point of the miter is against the base of the saw rather than against the fence. And this isn't really a miter now, this is a bevel. And for an outside corner, the short point of the bevel is against the base of the saw. Crown molding is kind of similar. Remember, you want to be concerned about where the bottom of the molding is, and that's this profile. So, for an inside corner, the long point of the miter is at the bottom of the molding, and the long point of the bevel is against the base of the saw. And for an outside corner, the short point of the miter is at the bottom of the molding, and the short point of the bevel is against the base of the saw. I know this might sound confusing, but it really, if you start to think in terms of short points and long points, it won't be long before you can give up on the visualization technique, and then cutting crown molding on the flat will be really simple. Now the other thing I covered in this program was cutting acute angles. The numbers on a miter saw gauge aren't friendly to most carpenters because they don't correspond to any of the numbers on a protractor. That's because they're negative numbers. They have to be subtracted from the angle of the fence. If the fence is set at 90 degrees, then you subtract these numbers from 90 degrees to arrive at the angle that you're cutting at. If your fence is set at 45 degrees, like it is for an acute angle jig, then you have to subtract these numbers from 45 degrees to arrive at the angle of the miter you wish to cut. Remember, if you're still using the visualization method, you're working with your eyes closed. With the long point, short point method, carpenters can open their eyes and really begin to enjoy their craftsmanship. Believe me, mastering the miter saw is just the threshold for some really interesting, challenging, and rewarding work. In future programs, I'll be demonstrating similar techniques for installing baseboard and casing, crown molding and coffered ceilings, wainscoting, and even hanging doors and installing mortise locks. I hope you'll join me.